Hi, my name is Nate, and for those of you who don't know who I am, I talk about finding remote jobs, digital nomad lifestyles, and then also inspiring people to go to events, whether it's through travel or just in their home city. So today we're going to be talking about where are some of the digital nomad hotspots in 2024. So this is a map of the world. Hopefully you know what this is, and you've actually looked at one of these quite recently or in the past. Jokes aside, as we go into 2024 and also beyond, the rise of digital nomad locations are only going to increase because more and more people are getting into this lifestyle and slowly realizing that you can work remotely from your home and then more importantly, from potentially anywhere, depending on the company that you work for. So these hotspots that I'm going to talk about later on in the video, there's five of them, but there are many, many more spread out throughout the world. And I can cover more of these in future videos if you want me to. Before you consider working at one of these digital nomad hotspots or just working remotely from another country in general, you gotta consider six factors. So the first two are tied together intrinsically. So what is a digital nomad visa? So certain countries around the world will allow you to work from their country up to like X number of days if you fit like a certain income threshold. So let's say you wanna work in Bali as a digital nomad or you wanna work in, I don't know, South Korea as a digital nomad, uh, one's a city, another's a country. This is just an example. You can apply for a visa program. You have to submit a lot of paperwork and then it takes time to get it back. But the general idea is you can work in a location in another country for up to, let's say, like 90 to 180 days. Some visa programs vary depending on their day requirements, like total number of days, but just be aware of that. And then also some of these programs have strict income requirements. So for example, some programs will say like you have to make $3,000 a month and provide, you know, pay stubs, W-2s, all that great stuff to show that you can work as a digital nomad and you're not going to be like, you know, leeching off the country when you're over there. Because the point of these programs is for people to work remotely from other countries, but also contribute to the economies of these countries in general. That's the kind of give and take relationship like with these programs in general. So the third is internet access. So I can't tell you how many times that I've seen, I don't know, YouTube videos of people that are just like a pre-digital nomad and post-digital nomad experiences. And one of the biggest things is the internet access. If you're going to a place that is like really, really, really remote and doesn't have good internet access, you're gonna get fired because you might miss an important meeting or you won't be able to submit a deliverable. So be aware or just research the quality of the internet connection when you're going to these places. Number four, community of expats. So in my solo traveling experience, I've really realized that the community of people that you try to rally around is the most important thing if you're trying to live in a place for an extended period of time. So as a solo traveler, you know, you go to a place for a couple of days, a week, maybe like a month or so, and then you move on. But if you're trying to stay in a place for let's say up to six months or whatever, you're going to want like a community of people to be with. Otherwise, like, let's be honest, like what's kind of the point? I don't know. I mean, it depends on how you want to approach the whole digital nomad thing, but there are co-working spaces that have already built in networks. Like for example, Selena is a great co-working example. They have like a network, like I think they're the biggest one actually, like they're a co-working company that have locations all around the world they do yoga retreats, they have events at their local co-working space, they offer accommodations, so it's just something to consider. Number five is the cost of living. Okay, so this is going to vary depending on where you go in the world. And it's an unfortunate reality that with the rise of these digital nomad hotspots, the cost of living goes up because typically the people that want to go to these countries might have a stronger currency than the local currency, like the US dollar is superior to a lot of currencies already, like in you know the developing world. So the cost of living goes up, unfortunately, as a side effect, which also pushes the locals out of these areas that they've lived in for generations. So, you know, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, but just be aware that the cost of living for certain places has gone up as a result of all these digital nomads flocking to these places. And then finally, weather and seasons. So if you're going to live in a different country, you have to research like what the weather is like. Like for example, Southeast Asia, tropical, very humid, lots of monsoon season rainstorms. So you've got to be prepared for that. And then if you want a place which is, you know, which has like four seasons or something like that, just be aware that you have to do your research. So those six factors 
are a good starting point if you want to consider working from, let's say, a DN like Hotspot, or if you just want to work remotely from another country. So just as a caveat, before we go into these five examples, these are countries, not cities. I am aware that like there are cities within these countries that serve as these DN hotspots, but the point of this video is to just kind of expose you to which countries out there have the programs or have communities already built in. So the first, of course, this doesn't come as a surprise, is Costa Rica. And we'll cover like the pros and cons. So Costa Rica, oh my god, like I'm going there in November for like a trip. It's going to be amazing. Like anytime you go to Costa Rica, you think of like serene forests, gorgeous waters, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the pros are that in Costa Rica, there's apparently a large expat slash digital nomad community already there. They have great internet access from what I've heard and read about because of the fact that the infrastructure is kind of already there and built. And then apparently they have a friendly digital nomad program. So the income requirements, which I mentioned previously, it's 3000 for a solo traveler, dollars, by the way, and then $4,000 for dependents. So just be aware of that. So a couple of cons that even though there's only one mentioned here, so the cost of living has gone up dramatically over the past like couple of years. Like I've, I've read and seen YouTube videos that talk about this like all the time, like, you know, all these digital nomads are like these tech bros that make like six figures plus with US dollars. They flock to Costa Rica, they buy property that increases cost of living. So just be aware of that. And then if you're not adjusted to like, let's say like a tropical type of like climate, it this might not be for you because like I've read that Costa Rica can get very warm, but then again, you can go beach diving, you know, or, you know what I mean? Like you can go to the beach, dive into the water, go cliff jumping to cool off, et cetera, et cetera. So Costa Rica is our first one. Our second location is Spain or España. And so the pros are apparently they have great internet access. This might vary, of course, across the country because this is more of a generic statement. The income requirement for their digital nomad visa is 2,160 euros per month. Just be aware that don't quote me on like the specific amount in these like slides because information varies widely. And then also at the same time, like a lot of the details for the programs might fluctuate from place to place to, and also time as well. So as of the time of this video, it's May 12th. And then the information that I'm pulling from was from an article published in February, 2024. So just be aware of that, like details may change. And then the last thing is incredible weather. So Spain is well known for its temperate weather, but I will mention something about the weather in the con section when it comes to summers and heat waves. So continuing on from the cons that I literally mentioned previously, so with the weather, so the summer heat waves in Europe are deadly. Like seriously, the as of a couple of years and continuing on, the heat waves in Europe have been getting really out of control. Like in Celsius, I believe it would be like 40 degrees Celsius, like plus. Like we're talking like really, really hot, intense summers. And here's the thing. A lot of places in Europe don't have air conditioning, which I found very surprising, even though I'm half French. But to be honest, I've never really lived in Europe too much. But from what I've read and from what I've seen, a lot of places like don't have AC units. So like you're literally getting cooked during the summer. So a common trend that I've been noticing is that during the summer, a lot of digital nomads will like flock to places that are cooler because Spain and like other locations in Europe have been having like a lot of intense heat waves. So something to consider if you're going during the summer months from let's say like June to maybe July or something like that, or maybe June to August, you never know, you know, cause like the heat waves are intense. And then the resulting like wildfires that I've seen also like in Spain, Greece, other locations in Europe, they're a real threat. So just something to consider. And then on the website that I was reading, it says that U S national employees can't apply for this type of digital nomad visa. This is a, a result of a policy that the Spanish government has passed recently. Only U.S. freelancers who have been in business for over 12 months can apply for their digital nomad visa. And then you also must have a university or college degree or at least three years of work experience in your field. So be aware that uh, for these digital nomad visas, the requirements are going to vary depending on where you go. So this is a great example of that. We have income requirements. We have education requirements. We have also being in business for 12 months as a requirement. So just stuff to consider. 
So this third location does not surprise anyone. Mexico, you literally search up like any article about digital nomad hotspots and Mexico City pops up. But we're talking about Mexico, the country, not Mexico City, the city, you feel me? So in terms of Mexico overall, they have a pretty flexible tourist visa, which allows remote workers to work up to 180 days, which can be extended. This is different from their digital nomad visa, by the way. But if you run out of the 180 days, I think you can apply to get it renewed, but the paperwork is slightly more complicated from what I've read compared to their digital nomad visa. So Mexico as a country has a low cost of living when you're out of the touristy cities. So I mentioned previously Mexico City, that just for your information is a hotspot for a city hotspot when it comes to DNs just across the board. During the pandemic, a lot of Americans chose to go to Mexico City because they were like, well, if I'm going to be locked down, might as well go to a place where the lockdowns aren't as restrictive. And also at the same time, it's gorgeous to live there. The cost of living like five years ago was like less. Now it's obviously more, but Mexico City is a popular destination for digital no nomads from what I've heard. There's a large expat community in Mexico and Mexico just as a country is just gorgeous. I mean, I've never personally visited before, but from the photos that I've seen, it's a gorgeous country. So the cons. So like I mentioned previously, the cost of living is increasing. So in the touristy cities, especially like Mexico City, Lord knows the cost of living has gone up as a result of all the Americans like flooding to Mexico City to work as digital nomads. In other parts of the country, I've read that the internet infrastructure is not really the best. So just be aware of that. And then power outages are common depending on where you go and also the time of year. Our fourth location is Croatia, and this does not surprise me at all because Croatia was one of the first countries to go the digital nomad friendly route. So the Croatian government noticed that during the pandemic, a lot of people were you know, trying to move to other places, trying to find other places where they could work remotely and just kind of have like lesser restrictions, I believe. And so Croatia was actually one of the first countries to go this route. I remember when I was in my younger days, like I'm 28 right now, but I remember when I was like 23, 24, I was reading all these like articles about like, you know, Croatia being one of the first countries to have like a digital nomad visa program. And, you know, I was under the delusion that I could, you know, go there and I was still in college at the time. So don't blame me. Okay. Everyone has dreams of like leaving everything behind and just going to a country to live there for six months or something like that. But they were one of the first countries to embrace like the whole digital nomad visa program. And so the income threshold for theirs is 2,600 euros per month. And then because they were one of the first countries to go this route, they have a great digital nomad infrastructure in terms of community accommodations, and then internet connections. Shout out to, I think it's called Saltwater Coworking Space in Croatia. Um, I followed their Facebook page and I even applied to be like one of their digital nomad ambassadors because I don't know, I thought I could actually like make it, you feel me? Um, never did it and stuff like that, but never got chosen either. But um, I've heard that Saltwater is a great uh, company that does like, you know, co-working spaces for nomads. They find accommodations, et cetera, et cetera. So. So this was an interesting con for Croatia, and I'm a little bit confused because like, I'm not necessarily sure if this is true because I read it on like a couple of articles, but apparently the population of Croatia is declining, maybe due to older generations like passing away or people moving from the country to go to other areas. But Croatia is not really that big of a country, but apparently with the declining population, it makes essential services harder to find. So for example, doctors was like one of the um, services that they listed on several articles. And I was like, really? Like, that's very interesting. But then again, declining population, they might try to attract more digital nomads with more incentives. So that could work for you. But Croatia as a whole didn't really have too many cons. I would also assume that, you know, with an influx of digital nomads, you have an increased cost of living. So just be aware of that as well. And then finally, Indonesia. This should not surprise anyone. And you're going to know exactly what I'm referencing. So I know I just said that I'm not going to talk about cities, but Indonesia contains one of the most popular destinations for digital nomads in the world, Bali. I feel like before the whole digital nomad like era craze that's going on right now, like everyone goes to Bali for like the spirituality and the fact that it's so serene just with like a living environment. But yeah, Bali has been a very popular destination and still remains so. Um, but unfortunately, 
there'll, there'll be a couple of cons with that, like what we'll talk about uh, in like the next slide. But Bali has Bali and also Indonesia, sorry, because we're talking about both right now, has an already existing infrastructure for digital nomads, depending on where you go. Bali, of course, has that already. Indonesia, some parts may not, others may do. And then it has an extra large digital nomad community in Bali because it's been a hotspot for Lord like the past 10 plus years. <laughs> My God, I found uh, internet articles like going all the way back to like, you know, 2014, 2013, talking about Bali as a DN hotspot. And I'm like, that's that's amazing. You know what I mean? And then better than average internet. Um, of course, this will vary across the country and stuff like that. But I've read that Bali has roughly good internet. You know, there's it's prone to outages and stuff like that, too. And plus, it's Indonesia. Like, Indonesia is, like, gorgeous as a country anyway. If you've ever been, I, you know, you would know what I'm talking about. But Indonesia is a gorgeous country to visit and just to live in. So these cons are more specific to Bali, I'm just going to say. But the cost of living has exponentially increased in Bali and other cities as a result of that in Indonesia. So the prices are not what they used to be with like accommodations. Like I remember a couple years ago, like you could find YouTube videos that said like, you know, I rented out a mansion for like a hundred US dollars for like two weeks. And like now it's like, you know, two grand a month or something like that, just to show you like the increase in cost of living over time. And then these cities are getting crowded. Like I watched a couple of travel vlogs about like digital nomads living in Bali and the traffic is actually like a pretty serious problem. Like it was crowded before with like, of course, the locals that live there and live their, their entire lives and stuff like that. But with all the digital nomads that live there now, the traffic has been so horrendous to the point where people are just like, dude, Bali's not worth it anymore. Like I'm going somewhere else where there's no traffic, there's not as many people, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just something to kind of consider, like if you're trying to go to Bali. I think that if I ever became a digital nomad or scratch that when I become a digital nomad, because I definitely want to try to live this lifestyle, I might try Bali just for like a sort of pilgrimage, <laughs> like a digital nomad pilgrimage. You know what I mean? Because like it's the, probably the most iconic like location for digital nomads in the world. And so I'd love to try it for like a month or two. And then if it doesn't work out, go somewhere else. But we've covered five countries and a city or two when it comes to digital nomad hotspots. I hope this inspires you to maybe do your own research, find out if there's other locations that you're interested in when it comes to the whole DN lifestyle, and then also working remotely from other countries potentially. You never know. This is not just for digital nomads, but you could be you know, someone that just works in a different country for X number of months. You can apply for a visa if you want to. Labels are very interchangeable, if that makes sense. Like, share, and subscribe for more content. I'll see you around.